We spent the last several videos talking about the small intestine because the small intestine is actually fairly complicated. We have a ton of chemical digestion that occurs there. We also have a lot of absorption. We're going to find in contrast the large intestine, its function is fairly simple. We should be able to cover all of the anatomy and the physiology in one video. So the first thing we're going to talk about is its anatomy. All right, so this right here, this is the terminal segment of the small intestine. This is the ileum. Again, we talked about the anatomy of the small intestine several videos ago. But the ileum of the small intestine is going to have to converge with the large intestine. So the point where the ileum actually converges with the large intestine is this little thing right here called the ileocecal valve. Now let's break that name down. The ilio refers to the fact that the part leading to it is the ilium, but the cecal refers to the fact that the direct region of the large intestine that the ilium empties into is the cecum. So down here we have the cecum of the large intestine, or we're going to call it colon from here on out. Colon is usually the term that's actually used, probably because it's shorter. Um, at the base of the cecum right here, this little thing that sticks off there, that's actually the appendix. The appendix is actually a part of the immune system. Um, you can live without one, but generally speaking, the appendix is going to be the site for the storage and maturation of some immune cells. It's actually considered, in some sources, a secondary lymphatic organ because it holds a lot of immune cells right here, particularly of the adaptive immune system. Anyway, if we go up from the cecum, this part of the colon that goes upward, this is the ascending colon. So if we're tracking the movement of what's left of the food, which at this point is probably going to be almost feces, um, it's going to be going up here. So this is the ascending colon. Now the ascending colon is going to terminate right here at about a 90 degree angle and then go to the patient's left. In this picture, it's going to be to the right. Uh, this right here is the transverse colon. Now the point where the ascending colon kind of bends into the transverse colon this is what's called the right colic flexure. Um, I usually refer to it as the hepatic flexure. The reason it's called the hepatic flexure is right above this would be the liver. Okay? I also like to avoid as much terms as possible, so it's just hepatic flexure. Okay? Now as the remains go through the transverse colon, eventually it's going to bend downward again at about a 90 degree angle to what's called the descending colon because the remains at this point, which is probably feces, is going to be moving downwards, or it's going to be descending. Now again, the region where the transverse colon bends into the descending colon, you can call this the left colic flexure, or I actually prefer the term splenic flexure, because right above this would be the spleen. So this is going to be my splenic flexure. And then again, going down is the descending colon. Now at the point where the descending colon starts to curve like this, this region is actually what's called the sigmoid colon. The term sigmoid means kind of forming an S. So if you kind of look at this, it kind of goes like this and then curves back down the other way. Okay, That's why this is called sigmoid. Right? Now the sigmoid colon eventually becomes continuous with this last region of the large intestine or colon called the rectum. Technically, the rectum is part of the large intestine. I mentioned that in the video where we talked about digestive and histology on the microscope. The rectum is technically part of the large intestine. If you look at this image right here, the very bottom where it really thins out, this is actually the anus. The anus is not technically part of the large intestine because it's made up of a completely different tissue. The anus is actually going to be stratified squamous epithelium, whereas the rectum is going to be the same as the large intestine, which is simple columnar. Okay? Now a little bit more on the anatomy here, there's not much left, but what you'll see on the large intestine is there's this kind of fibrous looking thing that kind of runs along the middle of each of the tubings of the large intestine. This is actually what's called the tania coli. Okay? Tania coli. Okay? Actually some ligaments right here that actually give some structure to the large intestine. And then what we also see is that the large intestine seems to be composed of a bunch of little humps like this. See this hump right here, hump right here, hump right here. Each one of these humps is what's called a hostrum, or plural, hostra. So all of these are collectively hostra. Okay, so hopefully you can tell what I'm talking about there. Now in terms of blood supply, it's going to be a mixture between the superior and inferior mesenteric artery. 
The inferior mesenteric artery is really more or less going to supply the descending colon, a small part of the transverse colon, and then the sigmoid colon. If we look at the initial transverse colon and the ascending colon, those will actually be su supplied by the superior mesenteric artery, which happens to also supply the small intestine. That's what I mentioned in one of the previous videos that there was some overlap. And then, same thing's pretty much true of the vein. The contents of the ascending colon and part of the transverse are going to be drained by the superior mesenteric vein. And then part of the uh, transverse colon, the descending colon, and the sigmoid are going to be drained by the inferior mesenteric vein. Now, of course, if we're going to be um, actively doing uh, digestion and absorption, we want to have maximal blood flow to the GI tract. So that blood flow is going to be through the mesenteric arteries. And of course, from the small intestine video, hopefully we remember that ultimately the vasodilation of those arteries is going to be through the action of vasoactive intestinal peptide, or VIP, which is released when chyme comes into the small intestine through distension. That's the stimulus for VIP release. I mentioned that it causes increased blood flow through vasodilation to the small intestine, but it will also do it to the large intestine. Okay, So I just wanted to mention that. And then when we absorb things from the large intestine, from the colon, it's going to go through the mesenteric veins. But the question is, what are we absorbing through the large intestine? turns out there's not really much. Um, if we look at this figure right here, we see that the vast majority of absorption was done in the jejunum. And I mentioned that in the small intestine videos. There's a little bit of absorption in the ileum. And then if we look down here at the large intestine, which is really only about five feet long, uh, there's not much that seems to be absorbed here. Um, there are some ions, sodium chloride and potassium, short chain fatty acids, which we'll talk about in a minute, vitamin K and biotin, and then water. Okay? There's really not a lot of absorption that occurs here. What I will say is the major things to really think about are these three ions and water. Okay? Really what the large intestine's job is, is to absorb water. Okay? That's the major job of the large intestine. If for whatever reason the large intestine doesn't have enough time to absorb the water, you get watery stool, also called diarrhea. In contrast, if the uh, feces, or what becomes the feces, stays in the large intestine for a longer period of time, you tend to get a drier, harder fecal material, okay? um, which can sometimes lead to constipation. The point is, is that the large intestine absorbs water. This is why when you have diarrhea, it often leads to dehydration, and they often say to drink some Gatorade or Powerade because the Gatorade and Powerade has water, but it also has these ions, sodium chloride and potassium. Okay? So that's the major job of the colon, absorb these things. And what's important to note is that water is mostly absorbed in the ascending colon. These ions are mostly going to be in the ascending and transverse colon, um, but that's what you need to get out of the large intestine. Now, it does mention here that there are, at the very end, short-chain fatty acids that are absorbed. Um, those ultimately come from dietary fiber. Now, I know what you're thinking. They always said fiber is indigestible, right? You can't digest fiber. So how is it that you're able to get short-chain fatty acids from dietary fiber? It's not your own cells that do this. There's very recent evidence that's come out, very strong evidence, that the way fiber is actually good for you is that bacteria in the large intestine, they perform metabolic transformations of some nutrients, which is a general process called fermentation. So bacteria in your large intestine, and bacteria is most concentrated in the large intestine, they can actually take up the fiber and they can metabolize it through fermentation into short chain fatty acids. And it turns out these short chain fatty acids can then be absorbed from the large intestine into the blood and those short chain fatty acids are actually anti-inflammatory. So fiber, while it's not directly digested by your own cells, it is metabolized by bacteria in here, your microbiome, and that fiber is converted to short chain fatty acids through those bacteria. The short chain fatty acids in turn are very anti-inflammatory, and that's part of why fiber has actually been shown, or at least correlated with, lower uh, risk of colon cancer. Because if you have anti-inflammation, you have a lower risk of colon cancer. Okay? 
um, when you have lots of inflammation, inflammation tends to promote cancer, uh, which is why we have such a high incidence of cancer in the Western society, because we eat a lot of inflammatory stuff. All right. There's only one other thing I want to talk about with respect to the colon, and that's its function in the production of feces and subsequent elimination of said feces. So hopefully we know at this point that the small intestine, specifically the ileum, is going to squirt its contents into the colon, specifically the cecum, through the ileocecal valve. We talked about that in the anatomical part of this video. And so initially, when we have the contents, uh, inside the cecum and the initial part of the ascending colon, it's not going to really resemble feces as much. So once these remains have moved into the cecum, they're going to move up the ascending colon, across the transverse colon, down the descending colon, and then through the sigmoid colon, and then ultimately end up in the storage region of the colon called the rectum. Okay? And the rectum is going to be the final storage site for feces. And again, in the cecum, in the initial part of the ascending colon, these remains aren't going to look much like feces, what we typically think of uh, through defecation. All right? But as we siphon off water, remember water is absorbed, and these ions such as sodium chloride and potassium, but especially the water, as that's absorbed from the colon, the contents of the colon are going to resemble more and more like feces. So by the time we get these remains into the descending and sigmoid colon, we might as well just consider that the fecal material. And so again, once we get to the sigmoid colon, generally all of the important things have already been absorbed and the remains, which would now be called feces, would wind up in the rectum for storage. Okay. Now, the rectum, as we said, was the storage site of feces, but there has to be a stimulus to eliminate those feces. Okay. Now this segment right down here at the very bottom, this is the anus. And in order to eliminate the feces, they would obviously have to move from the rectum out through the anus. And this is controlled through something called the anal sphincter. Now the anal sphincter is a set of smooth muscles that surround this opening and they control movement through it. The anal sphincter muscles are unique in the sense that they're actually always in a contracted state. There is no antagonist to these muscles. They're always contracted. And remember, when smooth muscle contracts, it actually closes a hole or a tubing. So by closing this, it prevents the feces from just coming out Okay, uh, when, you, when you don't need them to unnecessarily. And so this anal sphincter is always contracted. And so when you get the urge to defecate, or you voluntarily do it, these anal sphincter muscles actually relax. And that's what actually allows the feces, which are in the storage region called the rectum, to actually move through the anal sphincter and then obviously into the toilet, hopefully. And another thing about the large intestine is that its lumen, the inside of it, is loaded with glands called intestinal glands. We're going to look at these in much more detail when we actually cover the histology of the large intestine, so we'll come back to this much later. But this is a micrograph image of an intestinal gland. Okay, Here's another one right here that I've boxed in blue. And these intestinal glands are loaded with cells called goblet cells. So if you're actually looking at the large intestine histologically, there's the giveaway is that there's tons and tons of goblet cells. And what these goblet cells do is they produce mucus. And so the function of these intestinal glands is to secrete a ton of mucus that will line the surface of the large intestine. Okay? And so the inside of the large intestine, that is the colon, is loaded with this mucus. And so that's a protective feature because once the feces are formed, which usually is going to be end of the transverse colon and descending colon, we don't want that fecal material actually cutting up the simple columnar cells or the mucosal layer that actually lines the lumen. It's a protective feature. And that's especially important when we have feces that are actually kind of hard, which usually comes from increased time spent in the colon and we get more water absorbed, okay? Um, and so we have to have that protection, okay? But other than siphoning off and absorbing water, ions, some vitamins like K and biotin and short-chain fatty acids from fiber digestion through bacteria, the other main function of the colon, which again is more obvious, is elimination of the resulting feces from the rectum through the anus. Right. So hopefully this made sense. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.